thank you, Jim, uh, very much for that introduction. Uh, it's uh, all, all of you who are faculty, and I think a lot of you who are students eventually will realize that when you see some of our students go on to be successful, to do their own research, and to be active in their communities and internationally, like Jim has been, it's a great experience. It's a very good fortune, and I appreciate it. Jim was a great student at UCLA. He went to Guatemala in the early period, did one of the first studies of a Highland community there, and has gone on to um, do a lot of great work on migration. So thanks for the invitation, and uh, you're fortunate to have him around here. Uh, and we get to see him once in a while in Los Angeles. Also, I thank uh, Shirley and the Fairhaven College for the invitation. Um, I've had my tour of Bellingham the last couple of days. It's a beautiful town. I really enjoy it. I went to college in uh, Portland at Reed College, so uh, I love the Northwest. Um, and I look forward to having a short talk and then having a conversation for at least part of our time uh, between now and 1 or 120 or so. So I hope to finish in enough time to have questions and discussion with the group. So I'd like to start with a brief uh, question for all of us. So bear with me and just close your eyes for a second. And imagine a child in your mind's eye who's between a newborn and maybe one year old or so. Just close your eyes and just bring that child up in your mind. Think about it, him or her. So if you could do one thing that would be the most important thing to influence the life of that child, and open your eyes now. You can't draw this out. <laughs> I don't want it to go off. What would it be? Love that. So who said who said that? Yes, love that child. <laughs> what else came to mind quickly? Like the first thing that comes to your mind, what would you do? Hugging. Hugging. Mm -hmm. Educate. saying that? Oh, make sure the mother is healthy and is well. Yes? Yes? yes. Encourage and guide. Yes. Stay with the child and guide it. And Yeah, what else? What's, what, what are the important things you need to do? Yes, sir? Lead by example. Uh -huh. So act in a way that you would want your that child to act. Yes? Food, shelter, nutrition, security, yeah, from, from harm and from, yes? Healthy and clean environment. Healthy and clean environment, yeah, in general, in their home and in the neighborhood, absolutely. Comfort. Comfort the child, like how would you do that? Absolutely. So I, we, we could continue with this, and, it, and it's an interesting uh, topic, especially for to get group ideas about this. All these things are important, aren't they? There's no question. You don't need research to, to tell us that this is important. So, but in my worldview, one thing I want to talk about today is that although all those things are important, they're not the most important thing. The most important thing you could do to influence the life of that child would be to decide where on earth the child is going to grow up. In what cultural community? In what learning environment? In what place? How about rural Kenya? How about an urban slum in Lagos, Nigeria? How about a rural village in India? How about here in Bellingham? You could probably think of different neighborhoods in Bellingham or different families where that would matter. In what context, in what cultural and physical and community context is that child going to grow up? Now, once we think about it that way, I, I, I doubt if any of us wouldn't say, well, sure, of course that's important. But the interesting thing to contemplate for a moment is it's not usually the first thing that we think of. 
I might ask you, when you brought the child up in your mind as a mental image, um, people often think of kind of a child floating up there. Maybe some of you thought it's kind of a cute baby or a young child, a toddler, maybe. It's kind of floating up there in our mind's eye. Some of us may think of our own children or our siblings or friends or a specific child, but more often than not, we, we kind of think of this beautiful child floating up there. But, that child, but there are no such children like that. There are no children floating like that as individuals. <laughs> children are not individualistic. Our, our way of influencing the child is not through dyadic stimulation, although that's how we tend to think about it first. And dyadic stimulation is important. But since there are no children like that, you should always be thinking of a child in some place somewhere. Like when you thought of the child, did you think of the neighborhood? Was a child in a neighborhood? Or was it in a city? Or? So if there's something to take away from my discussion, it would be the next time you think about child development or what's good for children, what, do, do you know where this is? One of the things I'd like to talk about today and persuade you of is that well-being can be usefully thought of as the engagement of a child in some cultural community in the desired environments and activities desired by that community for children and the competence and skill to be able to do that and the psychological positive psychological experiences that can come from that kind of engagement and it's a useful way to think about well-being because it turns our attention to the setting around the child and we ask as an interventionist or someone who wants to improve the world, how can I change the settings around the child in addition to thinking about the individual child? So at the end of my talk, if I were to ask you again to think of a child, maybe we would think of that child somewhere. Um, it's not that children don't need to be loved and that they don't need stimulation and they need safety and security and good food and nutrition and all these other things. They do. But what does it mean to talk to a child in uh, rural western Kenya? What does it mean to talk to a child in suburban Japan? Who's around to talk to that child? Who are the peers in the child's life? So once you start thinking about the child somewhere, then all of these things, which are important to children, they take on a different flavor. It says, well, who's available to care for the child? What resources does that family have for the child? Here's a family that I worked with in uh, rural western Kenya among the Abaluya, a, a tribe in western Kenya. The Abaluya region is around 100 80 miles from where Barack Obama's father was born, uh, which was just south of Kisumu. This lady's husband lives in Nairobi and has a wage job to try to earn money to remit back to the rural farm where the mother and the rest of the children are living. There are different ways that philosophers and researchers and social scientists and biologists have thought about this question of what's good parenting, what's good development. And Professor Lauke could spend the whole year on a course just exploring this topic. I've got like three or four minutes with a slide. <laughs> so I have crystal, I've tried to simplify something that's extremely complex down to what I'm suggesting we think about as five basic answers to this question. The first is the evolutionary argument. Good development and good parenting consists of successfully passing your genes on to the next generation, reproduction. A related evolutionary argument is that every organism, including humans and human children, what, what they receive from the environment, from their parents, from their siblings uh, is information about the outside world. And your genes are prepared through epigenetic 
uh, processes to receive that information from the outside world and to recode your genes to respond. If your environment is stressful and dangerous and you receive that kind of information, your body responds in that way. So another answer would be to provide epigenetic information to the organism so that it can successfully adapt and survive. That's another definition of good parenting and good development. Then there's the idea that all children have basic needs. Oh, thank you. Have basic needs. And there are many measures and definitions of what these basic needs are. Um, and I made a list of five of them here. There are many proposed lists and different measures, but this is one way to think about it. The physical needs that have already, you've already mentioned, safety and security that we also mentioned, stimulation, which means, again, the appropriate and necessary engagement with the world through parents, through talk, through all kinds of means that all children need at some level. Responsiveness, which is different, which is contingent stimulation. When the baby does something, is there a response back? When you do something as a caregiver, does a child respond back? Absent that, children do not thrive. Children who face, for example, constant and perpetual chaos, violence, aggression, uncertainty about responsiveness, do not do well. Nowhere on earth would a child do well in that situation. And finally, a sense of identity and self. This is not individualism, but it's a sense of who we are in the world. My name, my group, my social identity, my family identity. You, children need one, and they need one that's stable enough that they can use it to live in the world. So there might be other basic needs. We can subdivide these, but this is another way to think about what's what's good parenting, what's good development, what would be good for children. Another is um, uh, the world religions and other textual authorities tell us what good parenting and good children are and how to do it. I, I won't say any more. Many, many communities around the world do base their parenting and their views about family life on such authority. This is one definition that's widely available and used around the world. Another is the relativistic model, which is whatever a community does and says is good parenting and meets basic needs, we need to respect that. And those definitions can vary quite widely. That is, there is no absolute definition. It's all depending just on what a community says it is. And finally, there's a contextual or eco-cultural definition which is that there are activities we engage in every day. And those activities are given to us by our families and our communities. And all communities have certain activities that they find more desirable than others for themselves and for their children. And the cultural learning environment that a child is in sends signals to him and to his parents about what those are. So this is different than relativism. I'm not a relativist myself, but I am a contextualist. I think the context matters a lot, but there are absolutely some things in context that we can measure that are better than others for children. And this leads to what I mentioned earlier as my idea, a useful way to think about well-being. Some of the other definitions I just showed you have evidence to support them. So they're not mutually exclusive in many cases. But this definition of well-being, I think, stands the test of the idea that the most important thing might very well be for a child in what place, in what cultural learning environment they're growing up. A does a child have the ability, does it, is it developed so that it has the ability to be engaged in the activities deemed desirable by that community? that meet the child's basic needs and that produce experiences psychologically that that community also will then find desirable. Notice that I've turned the psychological matter of, of, um, on its head. Um, notice that well-being is not hedonic pleasure. 
It's, it's not just feeling good. You know, well-being, sometimes you don't feel good, actually. This is one of the hardest things to get across about this idea. If we grow up in a community and we learn how to live in that environment, sometimes it's painful, it can be uncomfortable. People don't fit perfectly with their environment. So this is not a definition that, sells that, we, that says we have pleasure and we like it all the time and everything is good for us and we have positive affect. No, sometimes you don't. But the psychological experiences that we do have, which are not always positive, are engaging and appropriate and lead us to feel uh, that we are an important part of a family and a community. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, it turns our attention away from the dyad and towards the social setting. And these are seven features of activities in every social setting that I think are worth paying attention to and are important for children to learn uh, in their community. The goals and values, the tasks they have to accomplish, the rules and scripts for conduct. There's a right way to have dinner. There's a right way to be with your grandparents. There's a right way to, um, to uh, participate in your classroom with your peers. There's variation, but there's a script, and not all scripts will do. So children need to acquire effectively the appropriate norms. Relationships and people whom you can be with, whom you can trust. There's a great deal of concern in the United States about attachment, for example. I think the cultural problem is whom can I trust? Not, not, uh, not the individualistic idea of the attachment uh, model. It's more, how did we learn whom we can trust and feel safe with and whom we can't? Every culture solves this problem somehow. If they don't, that's not good, that's not good development. The motives and feelings that we bring to engagement. We may, uh, this idea of well-being is not that you walk through participation in your activities, you're engaged in them. You know the difference between just following along but having absolutely no affect, no engaged participation, and feeling alive and a part of that activity. That's what, more what well-being is to me. We need adequate resources or we have to deal with the resources that we do have in, for the family and for the child. And finally, some stability and predictability is necessary. Chaos, unpredictability, is not good for kids. Aggression, violence, constant sense of threat is not good for kids. Not being engaged in any stable or meaningful activities in a community that people think are good is not good for kids. Does not enhance well-being. So you can imagine these activities at a given stage of development. And then the, the path of activities that are moving forward. And then you can imagine the pathway is made up of activities. The stepping stone through your day are different activities you engage in. If you run that movie forward throughout development, and if a child is actively engaged, this would be a sign of well-being. The world is a very, very unequal place with regard to the um, resources and quality and stability of activities provided for children. And this is just to give you a brief glimpse. This shows um, the formal education that's, uh, that's available for children. And it shows two things. There's been an incredible expansion in literacy every generation. And the number of years of education is vastly different in different regions of the world. A related finding is that the absolute levels of literacy are going up everywhere, but the inequality in the achievement and attainment of literacy is increasing. Both things are happening. Same thing is true with uh, income. This is about, these data are about 10 years old, so some of the curves have turned up, the ones at the bottom. But the basic point is, that the purchasing power parity, that's what PPP means, uh, is different by a magnitude of 5 to 10 
between different regions of the world. So where you put that child, if you put the child in Africa, that's the purchasing power parity that it's going to have relative to other parts of the world on average. And also the inequality within a region or within a nation state on average is also increasing today. So both of these tendencies are going on. What is this approach to thinking about well-being and what's good for children and what might be a definition of good parenting, this more social, outward-looking definition, mean for those of us who want to support and help more children to achieve well-being and also to do substantial research on this topic either in the US or in other countries. One thing it means is that we need to pay more attention to measuring and then trying to improve the settings around children, not only the child. So we need to focus on improvements in the contexts around children in a community, and then try to see if that in turn changed the trajectory in development of the children in that community. We also have to do that in the context of, as I just said, vast differences in resources and growing inequality in many parts of the world, along with often rising average incomes and rising average um, literacy and other uh, outcomes that are also going on. So you have an opportunity there, but you also have unequal access to those resources. One way to approach this, of course, is to form an organization and go to another country or within our own country and try to improve the lives of children, or the quality of parenting, or the quality of the context and settings around children. And NGOs are one way to do it. There are upwards of 70,000 NGOs currently registered either in the United States or internationally, and I have a feeling that's a low number. Those are more the ones that are actually registered. NGO means non-governmental organization, and those are some of the other terms that are used to describe them. Uh, civil society is one. Many people who are in this world don't like the term non-governmental because it has no content. It's just non-governmental, but what is it? So civil society is one um, way to think about it, the idea there that it arises from volunteers, from people in the community, from concerned citizens. That's their organization. That also doesn't have a lot of content to it. Other terms are independent sector, uh, advocacy movements, volunteerism, which is still another way to, to think about it, um, transnational social movements. That's more of a way to, to think about the uh, fact that so many who care about a community internationally don't live in that community or their families don't live there. And so many organizations consist of world citizens or former citizens of a place or family members from a place who participate in NGOs that way. The government, USAID for example, calls them private voluntary, so private public is their distinction, and voluntary organizations. So, uh, Other names are, you hear this sometimes, non-state actors. I think that's more of a media term to refer to people who in, try to influence political change, but they're not part of a state, an, a state level organization, uh, and so on. So you can already see that this is, a, this is a complicated world that we're talking about. And the goal of this, the goal of these organizations, although they have varying um, stated goals, uh, in, in the child and family field, are all, in some way or another, to improve the well-being 
of children internationally or in the U.S. So they share a common mis mission, but they have many different ways of trying to do so. And many of them, although they do good work, I, I would have to say they wouldn't meet our, my standard of improving well-being. That is, they're not improving the, the activities and contexts around the child over the child's entire childhood lifespan through adolescence in such a way that the child can come to be an adult or young adult participant in that community, which to me would be the implication of this point of view about well-being. For example, having a feeding program for very young children only is, is valuable. It provides something, but it doesn't meet the well-being criterion because it doesn't focus on the activities around the child and it doesn't run that video through the entire course of childhood so that the child comes out the other end as a productive and functioning member of that community. These are some NGOs. I'll be honest with you, I went on the internet <laughs> and I, there are thousands of NGOs on there and some of them I knew, one of, one of them here I, I work with. So I just got some examples. This isn't like a systematic sample, these are just NGOs that are either large or I know about them. So you have, you have the governmental groups up at the top, um, which we're all familiar with. And these are either state or semi-state or UN-based organizations, and they deal with other governments. So their targets are not actually not communities, neighborhoods, and children. Their targets are other governments and what those governments' policies and practices are with regard to children. Then you have groups that are operational. They actually provide some service or something and advocacy. And advocacy groups attempt to change the beliefs, policies, laws, and worldview of another nation or another community's practices or our own practices. So, but there are many different types of those. One is like care, which deals with relief per se development services like Save the Children um, and Child Care International, which I'll talk to in a minute, a group that I'm involved with. Uh, there are religious uh, groups which do active proselytizing and evangelizing along with providing services like World Vision or Compassion. There are groups like Cultural Survival which try to keep intact small cultural communities that are threatened with elimination or exploitation, uh, such as the Amazonian Indian groups or Native American groups here in the U.S. or um, small communities around the world that are threatened by their larger and more powerful neighbors. Then you have refugee and immigrant support. This is what uh, Jim Lauke has worked on for so long and is an expert on. Then you have rights and advocacy organizations. I understand there's about to be a film festival you can watch 22 films, how many films, on this very topic. But this is a whole other domain. And, and there, are, there are scores, often hundreds of groups, that are essentially doing one or more of these things. And finally, there's, a, there's an activity at the bottom called research and analysis firms, some of which are for-profit, some are non-profit. I gave a few names there. You may not have heard of Chemonics, John Snow Academy. These are organizations whose budgets range from 300 million to a billion dollars a year. When you hear about foreign aid programs from USAID or United Kingdom or other countries, they often contract that money with organizations like those who then do planning for international aid. And there are many of them. And um, uh, some do very good work and, and essentially attempt to manage aid programs overseas. Uh, tens of thousands of people are employed in the NGO industry and many others, and, and many of them are in international communities and some are in the U.S. The benefits and costs of NGOs are once again summarized in this slide, although we could go on for a long time about any of these topics. The first half of the slide shows some of the concerns people have about the role of NGOs. The bottom half of the slide shows some of the benefits that, nonetheless, I think they bring. 
I particularly think that NGOs bring benefits if they improve the well-being of children as I've defined it. That's essentially sort of my message about the change and inequality part here. Are they enhancing well-being? I think we need to, as researchers, as students, as faculty, we need to really ask ourselves that question. Many groups are, some are not. And I think we, our role in part is to be the fair witness to decide, to think about that. So you see all the issues with the roles of well-being, uh, of NGOs at the top. Um, and these are all real problems. I think at the bottom, there are many positive roles they can and do play. They don't necessarily replace other organizations, indigenous or not, but they can complement them. Um, regardless of what you think of NGOs, um, in many countries, they are the only way to provide services, and, and particularly to have advocacy, because under one party rule, in many countries, there is no such thing as internal advocacy, unless it comes from an NGO. So whatever we think of the nature of their advocacy and their services, there isn't a default. So the real question is, is it better to have that than to have essentially nothing? Um, many of the funds that come to NGOs either come from governments in the first world who invest in organizations as intermediaries because they don't want to just drop cash to another government or directly into a community without a program, or the funds otherwise wouldn't be given. I'm going to talk in a minute about Child Fund International. Forty percent of its contributions come from individuals in this country who either sponsor a child or sponsor a program in another country. That's not fungible money. They wouldn't give the money otherwise. So if we want those funds to help well-being, that's the only way a lot of that money is going to be given. They can empower local communities, and if done appropriately, I think they can enhance well-being. And I think we can contribute by supporting these kinds of organizations in a, in a helpful way. And I'll talk a little bit about, as researchers, what can we do, and as, as engaged activists, what can we do. Uh, I'm on the board of Child Fund International, which um, is an advocacy and direct services organization, an NGO. Um, I'm on the program side of the board primarily. What kind of program services should we offer and how do we know we're doing a good job? Uh, Child Fund International's budget's about $210 million a year. Um, about half of it comes from contributions from individuals who sponsor communities, families, and children. The other half comes from a wide range of other sources. Many NGOs have diverse sources of funding. Some funding for NGOs comes from the government to the NGO that then delivers the service. Some comes from individuals like us who contribute. You may sponsor a child. You may sponsor a school or something. And this is the motto or the mission of Child Fund. If you think that the well-being of children is important to the future of our world, then you would want to hopefully do something that could enhance the lives of children such that they can in turn become leaders. Whom should... There, there are three and a half or four, three and a half billion or more children in the world, so which ones should we be focusing on? The definition Child Fund uses, I think it's a useful one, is children who are deprived, excluded, and vulnerable. Deprived, excluded, or vulnerable. Deprived of resources or of supports in their own part of the world. Excluded due to social stigma or class or some other or racial or other ethnic criteria, and vulnerable because of health reasons or threats to their safety or in other ways. The importance of supporting deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children is, as I said earlier, is you have to start in early childhood 
and you have to sustain that support until they become young adults. So the, the goal of Child Fund is to produce a young adult who can engage in the activities of their own community and make it better. These are the core programs. I'm sure these are familiar to you because many NGOs have a version of these kinds of programs. Uh, Child Fund also um, pioneered what's called the uh, Safe Places or Safe Haven program in disasters. We've just seen this in Haiti, in the tsunamis, and in other places. One of the things that children need after such a catastrophe is a safe place to go. They're separated from their families. Their families are lost. They're vulnerable in many ways. They're deprived and excluded and vulnerable. So Child Fund has a Safe Places program where we go in and set up such places. We offer children a way to get identification, to be reunited, to find out who they are and how they can go back to someone in their community if their family is not there for them. We did this for thousands of children after the tsunami, for example. And advocacy for deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children. The Bright Futures program develops the idea that the children's own involvement in the program, especially after early childhood, is an important part of designing the program. What is their experience of being deprived, excluded, and vulnerable in their own words? And how can we use that experience to tailor a program to fit them best, to achieve well-being, which is engaged participation in the activities in their own communities? So we form partnerships with communities. Child Fund does not have programs where there's not a community board or organizations that co-sponsor and run the program. So unlike many other NGOs in this, war in this field, you know, we don't go in and just provide the service. We find a community that's interested in doing something. We partner with them and with the government that has to be involved in some way. And then we provide the service. Otherwise, it won't sustain itself. We have a 12 to 15 year engagement period. One of the things about uh, uh, child services is, uh, is to ask when you're going to leave. You know, the def a program that's there for 30 years is an unsuccessful program by, by this definition. It's not that they're not children that are still deprived, excluded, and vulnerable there. It's that if you can take a child through the cycle and get them to the point where they can participate and be a member of their community, then you need to move on to the next one. There will always be far, far more deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children than there will be NGOs to help them. So the children and families in a community are involved in our programs whether or not they actually have a sponsor or actually have funding. This is an important principle. So we distinguish between children who are sponsored by somebody and children who are enrolled to be sponsored but are not sponsored. So we never get in the situation where you have a preschool program in a community but only kids who have sponsors internationally can go. Or you can't go to the health center because if you don't have a sponsor, you're not eligible to go. Everyone can go. But not everyone actually has a funded uh, program or sponsor behind them. How are, how are efforts to support children around the world to improving their well-being actually working? I think this is where universities and researchers and students and places like this should have an active role, frankly. Not only in supporting or advocating for, for deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children or, or other, other groups worthy of our support, but to ask some hard, good research questions about how they're actually doing. And this is one thing that I've worked on in my own research and, and am trying to encourage and extend within Child Fund, where I now am involved. One way to ask about this for any organization at any level is um, who works for it? Are the people working for your organization engaged, involved, adequately paid, care about the organization, are high quality? That's one thing, one thing we need to 
you know, you need to look at. Another is, are we directly related to and have good relationships with the children and families that you serve, with the funders and sponsors who are paying, with the community you're in? As I said, Child Fund doesn't operate unless you have a community organization as a partner. And they're contributing and Child Fund is contributing. Does the government at least tolerate you, if not actively support your work? You cannot operate as an NGO in very many places, if, if any, without a government uh, license or, or you know, registration. What about the other NGOs? I, I, I just indicated how many there are out there. In Kenya, there are 57 NGOs serving children and families. They have an organization just to talk to each other so they don't step on each other's toes and they collaborate. This raises the question of why there's so many. Uh, one thing about Child Fund International and I think other organizations is to gradually evolve the idea that the first world contributes resources to NGOs who go to the third world to deliver them. We're trying to develop a model where Child Fund organizations will be developed in the countries where we're operating now so that people in those countries will contribute to their own child fund work. They'll support deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children in Kenya, but Kenyans will give the money and will run it. We're trying to move to that model. We have 13 countries now that are in the Child Fund Alliance. Most of them are first world countries like Germany and Canada. And but some of them are um, Thailand, Korea, and one other that used to be recipients but are now independent organizations. So that's one direction I think we should move, which is to empower citizens in those countries to do this work themselves, but under a common umbrella. It sort of breaks that cycle a little bit. Um, so how are we really doing? Are we improving well-being for kids? Here are four ways you could try to measure that, that that are common. At least three of them we've seen before. One is an indicator. Um, the gross domestic product of Kenya went up 3% last year. The literacy rate has improved by 5%. Those are just like national indicators or regional indicators. They're interesting, but they're not very useful for well-being, in my opinion, because they don't meet the criterion of, of asking directly whether the services you're providing increased and enhanced the ability of children to engage productively in the activities deemed desirable in their community. Another is outputs. Uh, Child Fund has five more schools in Kenya this year than last year. Child Fund uh, had 10% more children in preschool programs compared to last year. Those are outputs. More of what it is we're funding is happening. Outputs are very commonly confused with the last two indicators I have up here. One is outcomes. Outcomes are Child Fund had more preschools. The children in our preschools more often were successful in the public schools and did better than other children in the community who were not in Child Fund programs. You see the difference between that and a, and a uh, output? Finally, is the hardest thing to get with your impacts. Impacts are when you do an experiment. There are a thousand children in this community. We randomly assigned half of them to be in the Child Fund program and half of them are not in the Child Fund program. And two years later, the children in the Child Fund program are twice as likely to have entered school and their parents are twice as supportive of girls as the other group. The impact is a comparison between your program and a control group. If you don't have a control group, you can have a wait list, wait list control group, which is we have a thousand children in the community. We can't possibly serve more than 300. So we'll just randomly pick 300 and the other 700 will be in our control group. <coughs> Impacts, you, you very seldom if you listen, read carefully, you'll very seldom see organizations who are otherwise doing good work actually tell you they had an impact. They'll tell you they had output. 
They'll tell you they had outcomes, maybe, but not many will tell you that they had an impact. That is, compared to the village down the street, we're doing so much better than they are, or not. Impacts and outcomes are the gold standard for seeing whether a program actually is delivering on what it wants to do. There's also the relative opportunity cost, like what if I invested in this other NGO down the road, maybe they're doing better. <laughs> so there's also that comparison. Finally, the role for research, in my view, to understand children's well-being is a committed, fair witness. I know this isn't the same as what I think some of us here are, are also doing very effectively, which is advocacy, activism, bringing out the word, getting the word out. Committed fair witness is a different model. It needs activists, but it's not like that. A committed fair witness is committed to improving well-being for children or human rights or role of services for migrants or something. But we're a fair witness in which we ask, is it really getting better? Is this organization really having outputs and outcomes that are improving what they say they're improving? I think that's the role that research should play. And the thing we have to recognize about that role is that sometimes you find out that an organization you care very deeply about isn't actually delivering. It isn't doing very well. We have to be willing to accept that and have a learning in, in the organization where we learn from that. These are some of the outcomes that Child Fund is specifically looking at. Healthy and secure young children. Weight, health care provision, and caretaking for children. Educated and confident children in middle childhood. Did they finish primary school? What's their actual reading competency, their literacy skills? And how efficacious and engaged are those children in their community? Skilled and involved youth. Are they employed? Do they care about their community and feel they belong in it? And are they forming their own families? Finally, are they networked in their community? Again, this is all in the well-being kind of focus. Child Fund International itself cannot change the inequality structure in the world. But we can increase the odds for success and well-being of deprived, excluded, and vulnerable children if we measure it carefully, plan our programs carefully, and sustain them. Here's a program in Ethiopia. I'll conclude briefly with a couple of examples. The girl doing the beautiful coffee ceremony that they have in Ethiopia where you prepare espresso coffee uh, and uh, they, they love popcorn. You always have popcorn in Ethiopia. She's, she made some popcorn there. One of the things about, I think, an effective NGO is that you're very public and transparent in what you show about your program. So this is a um, screen, a little bit hard to see, about who is eligible to be in the program. In many countries, um, people believe, because of past experience, that there's corruption. How do you encourage people to realize that there is no corruption? You have a very explicit rule about who can be in, and you stick to it. Um, these are messages in Kenya about the preschool and early childhood programs that we operate there. It says what the objections are on the right. It shows what it actually is on the left. And it has 12 universal values, which I found in a school, like just at random, and I thought it was great. Love, peace, honesty, responsibility, freedom, respect. So there's sort of a list of values there that they are trying to, and these, are, these things are posted up on the, on the wall of the school. This is, this is like, um, this is uh, six feet high, this picture. I mean, these, uh, these things. So everybody can see them? Oh, there's another example. Children can be heard and seen. Because in traditional African culture, children are not heard and seen. So we're trying to change something there. This is the Bright Futures program for youth. Again, you have the explicit rules for being in the program, why we're doing it, why it's there. Hospital ethical service. Corruption and unethical service is common in third world countries, unfortunately. 
and we try to counter that. This is an HIV program in uh, Addis Ababa. I'll show you another one in Kenya for a minute. Um, there's about seven to eight percent of the citizens of Addis Ababa, a city of about five million people, have AIDS or HIV. Children, parents, everyone. It's, it's, it's terrible. So what do you do? We form community groups and we ask people and gradually get people to come out in the open and say so. Second, we have a treatment program where we treat the parent and, the ch and their children in their home. This is a neighborhood where uh, we're providing these services. You go in the, you hire local people, school leavers, unemployed youth, you train them, you send them out to provide, give them school fees for the children food and health care for the parents, and visit them every week. So with uh, 350 to 400,000 cases, there is no way that you can have any hospital or other public service. You have to have community-based home services like this. These are people living in very, very poor circumstances. Here's a program in Kenya, a health clinic, a preschool. The children at the bottom there, there's the uh, main highway <laughs> going to Busibi. Uh, and when it rains, there is no main highway going to Busibi. The, the, half the children in that picture um, uh, are AIDS orphans. So we sponsor preschools. All the children come. Half of them, roughly, are AIDS orphans. They're not identified as such, but we pick those communities to work in. These are the parents and caregivers of the orphans. We offer them employment services. We gave them all bicycles. We give them um, a food and other nutritional supplements so that they can at least be available to care for the children. Again, you, there's no way, there's no public health service available unless you have it delivered to the local village. And here are the people in the program in Kenya. The researchers at the University of Nairobi, I'm collaborating with some, are trying to work on seeing whether this program is effective and whether you can spread it to other places. This is a school where you have a lot of infected children. You see that pile of wood there? Children bring, bring a stick of wood each, and then they take the wood and they go to a funeral of someone who's died in their school. So you come in the morning, you bring your stick of wood, you carry the wood to the funeral, and one of your fellow students has either died or their, fa their parents have died. This is a slum pro a neighborhood in Nairobi where we're supporting the school where the school grounds are like an oasis in a vast sea of shanties. I think that NGOs and our research and personal participation in NGOs can improve well-being for children. Uh, it's not easy. It has flaws. It needs work. I think that in addition to advocacy, I personally think it's useful to bring our research skills to this and to ask some questions that then can improve these organizations so that they can provide better services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And we're going to um, open it up to questions right now. And we'll use this microphone, try to get it around to people. That way, your questions will also be recorded. So who would like to start? Maybe some students? Let's see if there's any student that wants to start it. Hi. Um, you were talking about cultural context. Um, can you speak to the issue of uh, Americans adopting orphans from other cultures <coughs> like China or, or Nigeria and bringing them here and bringing them up? Yes, um, that's a good question and of course you know it's a hot news topic right now not only because of Haiti but because of revelations about uh, orphan and uh, adoptions in China and elsewhere. Um, I think that there, there's also there has been an extensive adoption uh, US adoption network in, in Europe from Ethiopia which is another place I just showed a little bit we have a very high HIV infection rate and uh, deep poverty. And so I think celebrities have uh, or brought children from there. So 
I think there's a role for this. I think that it's um, a small part of the solution, and the solution is what I tried to illustrate in my talk, which is to enhance well-being. That is to enhance the setting and the environment around children in those communities so that hopefully you can increase the odds that they can grow up and participate and engage in their own society. So you saw the HIV AIDS program that we have in Kenya and Ethiopia. That's the model. You hire local people, you train them, you put them out in the community, you give them skills, you keep the children healthy, hopefully, and the parents hopefully functioning better so that the odds of success are greater than they would have been otherwise. Is it detrimental, is what I'm really to the child that's extracted? Is adoption, uh, um, I think the research, uh, let, me, let me give two answers to that. Um, the, the sharing, circulation, and social adoption of children is a widespread and common practice already all around the world. You know, in my research in the Abaluya, in that village I showed you, 23% of the children in the households in my own community I was working in were not, that was not their natal home. They were loaned, borrowed, uh, adopted, apprenticed, shared with their cousin, their aunt, their sis mother's sister. Uh, siblings are exchanged to help out in other homes. It's extremely common. So it's not that child circulation is inherently disadvantageous for children. It's the context and setting in which it's done. There's a very nice study done in um, West Africa on this topic where child circulation is very common. Uh, this study found that uh, child lending or sharing in which there was relatively good relations between the sending and receiving families uh, had a positive benefit for the child. Where the child didn't know the circumstances, you know, they were just sent somewhere, like a lot of these adoptions are, there was a slightly negative, but also not, not particularly difficult. But where there was a hostility and resentment over it, there was a negative outcome. So, the, so the, the, the meaning of the relationship and the exchange to the adopted and adoptee families and the kids is an important part of the answer to your question, that is whether it's good or not. It can be good, it can be deleterious. Uh, it never should be a substitute for enhancing community well-being. Yes. Um. I'd first like to say that I like the way that you um, talked about contextualizing, because I think that's really important. Um, so, so many of, uh, so much of um, activism focuses only on individual sym symptomatic things without looking at the context, which would make our activism more effective. But I also thought that the context could even be bigger, because um, there's a website called Survival International, and they they document and try to help tribal peoples around the world. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about one tribe in particular, the Dongria Khand in India, and they were a mountain people. Uh, they were very a very healthy community. I would say all those basic needs that you listed in, in your definition of well-being, I, I think that those all were present in that community. And, and then, you know, this British mining company perceived that it had the right to mine bauxite from under that mountain, which is used to smelt, it just smelt into aluminum. And that's, that's, that can be applied to all other healthy communities all around the world. It's this other culture that perceives it has the right to some sort of resource in, under its land. And that's, that's where this inequality is, 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 is stemming from. And so that, that context, that larger context, makes me feel like we also, as well as, as doing this, this NGO work, questioning the reasons why this is happening in the first place. Actually maybe confronting the power structures that are of these extractive economies, you know. I mean, that's, that's never brought into this discourse. I agree with you about that, and um, I'd have to say that um, my model for um, bringing research and commitment to improving child well-being 
is, how should I say, it's compartmentalized. Psychology is divided on compartmentalization. <laughs> Some psychologists say it's an inevitable, natural function of the human mind and it's good for us, and others say it's not so good for us, that is, it uh, creates neuroses and uh, uh, splitting. Um, I tend to be in the former camp, at least on this topic. Uh, and the reason I do is that um, as, a, as a committed fair witness, I want to increase the odds that the children, even in that mining community that's been damaged by international global mining interests, improve the odds. On the other hand, I'm angry about the growing inequality and the governmental uh, uh, ignorance and uh, letting, uh, letting these things happen. As a citizen and a voter and an activist, I work against that. As a researcher who's trying to improve child well-being in my lifetime, I work for Child Fund. I, I, I'm on the board of Child Fund. There are 460,000 children enrolled in Child Fund programs. If we can improve Child Fund programs that much, we will, and I believe, and do good research on it, will increase the odds for those 460,000 children, or at least many of them. That's good enough for me. That's not so easy to do, to raise that kind of money every year and to invest it wisely. With my other compartmentalized mind, I'm pissed off <laughs> about global inequality, and I'm with James trying to do something about it. But I commend the uh, committed fair witness model to you, nonetheless. Yeah. I have a few questions for you. And um, first of all, you spoke about empowering citizens in these countries to support their well-being changes on their own. And first thing that came to my mind when you're talking about that is a lot of the families who cannot afford to allow their children to get an education because they need them to work to gather the resources they need to survive. Are these, uh, are the NGOs working in place with the children, are they creating jobs in these countries that support the child care and health benefits, um, not only to the children, is this helping the local economy as well? There are very um, impoverished countries in which the uh, economic impact of NGOs is measurable. That is, they employ thousands and thousands of relatively well-educated citizens of those countries, keeping them from you know, brain drain to the West or from not being gainfully fully employed. And they employ a lot of these local community workers, such as the examples from Kenya and uh, Ethiopia that I showed, um, who otherwise would not have been able to have any employment or nothing like that. And so they would have been youth who did not have well-being in that way. Um, Child Fund is trying to improve the employment possibilities of youth in their programs by providing them with training. Um, this is an area where the evidence from our program work has not been good. That is, we provide the training, but it has not, in fact, led to significant gains in employment for child fund use compared to other use. So we're rethinking how best to do that. Um, and uh, one way is to train more local people to provide uh, the kind of services we provide, which are health, education, water, microcredit, um, uh, women's services, things like that. Uh, you know, to train a local cadre and ultimately have a local child fund group work in the country. Um, I just had another question, and I was wondering, aside from investing money, how do you become involved in the hands-on efforts that these NGOs are conducting? If you go to the websites of moderate to large-scale NGOs, they have a section there called... Um, uh, employment or uh, uh, work opportunities. And uh, I would encourage you to, if you're interested in this field, to um, train yourself in the professional disciplines that are involved or on the research side or on the services side, the administrative side of that world, 
and try to get a job with one of them. Um, I, I don't know the actual number, but um, the, the major NGOs doing child and family services is a 12 to 15 billion dollar industry. World Vision budget this past year was 1.2 billion dollars. These are large businesses. From a purely economic point of view, this is a market. The NGOs have a brand. They raise money, they have staffs. Child Fund employs 1,700 people around the world. Most are in other countries, but you know, they're like 300 to 350 are in the US. So uh, there, are, there are career opportunities, and if you care about this world, this is a way to have a good career and serve children and families in other countries. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, I find this very fascinating because it's something that I want to do in my future. I want to work for a, an NGO, so I definitely agree with everything that you've said. There's just one concern that I have, and that's how, like, how do I personally go about this without making the same mistakes of people of the past? I know that where I come from in Australia, very recently they're dealing with problems with the Aboriginal community because people went in there, gave them healthcare, gave them education, and gave them all the things that they presumed that they wanted, and it in fact, you know, had m more, like, caused more harm. So mm -hmm. my question, I guess, is like, does the organisation, for example, that you're involved with, do they have meetings or kind of consultations with the local people to sort out what they want and not what we want. Because I really don't want to think that I'm doing something really good. Because you mentioned, you know, perhaps changing something that had been a part of African culture for many years because we feel that it should be changed. But th that's what really concerns me is like maybe we're wrong and I don't want to, you know, how do you kind of deal with that? Um, the example that I showed was of um, giving children and parents a voice in the programs and, and making them visible and listening to their experience of being deprived or vulnerable and so on, and which is not a common experience. Usually issues like that, uh, women's, uh, women's involvement in uh, professions or in education or uh, uh, incre improving their health care and so on, is another area where maybe this traditionally wasn't the role of women. Usually there are factions or groups in a community already who disagree about those matters. It's not that everybody in Western Kenya thinks that children shouldn't have a voice in school, but just that some do. If no one thinks that children should have a voice or women should get services or something, you won't have a community partner, will you? So you better choose something else. We have a half a dozen different programs that we've developed, so Maybe we do a water program there. <laughs> There's always people that would like to have better water, uh, healthy, uh, fresh water, and have it available. In the Kenya example I showed you briefly, the schools in these um, huge uh, shanty areas have no water. There's no piping. There's no fresh water whatsoever. So we provide all the water, fresh water, for all the thousands of kids in the schools in that area. In order to do that, you had to have community buy-in, because if you didn't, they would steal the tanks and the pipes overnight. The next day you'd come back, be gone. But they're not gone. They're not stolen. That's because Child Fund made a deal with that community and said, don't mess around with these services because thousands of children are benefiting. So the short answer to your question is, if there is disagreement in a community, but there are many who share your view, then I think it's perfectly appropriate to do it. If no one does, I personally think that, as a committed fair witness, we're, we're not achieving our goal of enhancing well-being because those children will not be <laughs> successful. So pick something else. So in the beginning, you kind of mentioned um, what was the optimum, like the, the question you asked everyone in the beginning, and then you said that the environment was um, yes. like th that question. Um, so go, kind of going back to what Shandy just said, um, uh, how do we um, give children the optimum environment? Because the optimal environment is based on where you're brought up. 
And if you are brought up in a society that says, you know, the optimum environment is, you know, children, you know, going to school and maybe coming home after and doing work in the field, you know, how do we, how does your organization keep that cultural environment while giving them a better environment, while providing like the optimum water, like better water quality? How do they provide for um, certain resources without stripping away the cultural components of a lot of societies? Because that does seem to happen with a lot of NGOs. While I was in South Africa this summer, this past summer, I did work with several NGOs and I felt like um, with the initiation of Western culture, it was stripping away a lot of the Zulu culture that has been there for far longer than Western culture. So how does your organization differentiate between the two? Yes, so um, even in the few examples I showed, um, the, the programs have community buy-in, sometimes government buy-in, or at least passive consent, and community members are employed in operating them. We also pick programs and services that, as this last questioner just said, are at least not uh, in completely inconsistent with what's practiced in that community. There are plenty of ways to support children's well-being without always directly confronting uh, cultural differences. But sometimes there are those differences. Um, and in those cases, Child Fund's model is to think long term. Again, we have the model that you're going to be in that community for 12 to 15 years and imagine a child starting preschool. What can we accomplish by the time they're 16? In that amount of time, with community consent and, and support, our goal is to produce a program that can enhance the well-being of that child in their community, in their cultural community. If not, in my view, we shouldn't be operating there. There is no dearth of children who are deprived, excluded, and vulnerable who can benefit from these kinds of programs and retain their local culture as well. I don't know the programs you were working with, but um, it's not, you don't have to do it that way to improve the odds. That's, I think that's our approach to it. There are many ways. Also, no child or family has to participate. It's not coercive. If they don't want to send their children to preschool, they don't. Th that's why I showed you the picture in the preschool, like what are the reasons to go to preschool? It's because a lot of parents don't send their kids to preschool because culturally, in that community, children don't have any reason or intelligence until they're seven. So why should we waste our time and money sending them to preschool? So our response to that is we show them some reasons. Those reasons are all generated by the local workers in the school, not directly by child fund. But a lot of the parents don't do it. But some do. If those children do better, our prediction is that other parents will look around and say, I want what that mother has, I want what that mother has. And they'll start doing it. And in fact, you do see that. In the Ethiopian preschools, there's huge waiting lists because of that. They see what can happen, but there aren't enough preschools. I think we'll have one last question from back here. Thank you. Um, there was an article a couple of years ago by Ke about CARE, and CARE won't take any more USAID. And it has to do with what a number of the students have talked about. And the reason they won't take it is that um, NGOs like World Vision receive that, and then they sell it to in whatever country they are. And this happened to be Africa. They sell it and then run their organization from what they sell. Well, the, the interesting part, or the sad part, of course, is they're undermining the local farmers. You know, they can't, of course, we subsidize all these big ag companies, and they take the grain over there. These farmers then can't even support their people. So I think what, what I'm hearing a number of people say is that it has to do uh, one, with the way globalization has destroyed cultures and destroyed people's ability to even make a living, and, um, and then do NGOs just go in and kind of uh, continue that by um, 
you know, some of, the, some of what you do. Yes. Um, well, I'm, I haven't studied many other NGOs, but I, my short answer to your question is yes, some of them do that. And a committed fair witness should do research on it and publicize it and try to get them to stop it. Meanwhile, we should also look around at organizations, I think Child Fund is one of them, that doesn't do that kind of service. We don't, we don't do this um, in-kind sales, as they call it. If you look at organizations, uh, NGOs, financial, you'll often see a line that says in-kind, in-kind sales, that's part of what you're talking about. They get resources either donated or given to them, food, medical, and then they go over to the countries and they undermine the <laughs> local economy. Um, I don't think that's a good practice. It doesn't meet my definition of enhancing the well-being of families and children and communities, does it? So by, just by that criterion alone, you, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't want to support it. Now, my compartmentalized view of activism is that you work against that and you try to improve the quality of Child Fund or other programs, there are many, that I think do pretty good work on balance and that deserve our support. Uh, and don't despair. The fact that these things are happening and can be exposed is part of our responsibility. It's also our responsibility to do a positive service where we can, and I think there are positive ways to do it. And as researchers, we should be the ones out there being a committed but fair witness to what is actually happening. And I think that's a very useful role for scholarship and, and for students, in addition to service. Okay, let's thank Tom for coming today. Thank you. Thank you all very much.